Thank you all very much. Uh, this is a great honor for me. Uh, the fact is, as I look across this crowd and see the essence of New York City, I'm reminded as well that Meredith and I have lived here more than 40 years, and we think of ourselves as New Yorkers, but we have never lost contact with the Great Plains, the populous part of the region where we grew up. I do want to be careful in my remarks because when Bill had me speak at Hyde Park at Christmas time four years ago, I described how President Roosevelt was a demigod, D-E-M-I-G-O-D, in our family. And the local reporter said, Tom Brokaw accused Franklin Roosevelt of being a demigod, so I'm going to be very careful here tonight. There have been more than a few occasions in my life when I wish my parents could be present for this kind of an occasion. This is such an occasion, for they were the political offspring of President Roosevelt. They were working class citizens of the Great Plains, caught in the terrible downdraft of the Great Recession. My mother wanted to go to college to study journalism. She graduated from high school at 16. The college cost $100 a year and it was beyond reason for her to think about going to college. So she went to work in the local post office for a dollar a day. And in that job, she became the managing editor of almost every town in which she worked because she heard everything that was going on. <laughs> her father lost the farm and managed to get a job for a dime an hour at a local granary in a small town. My father, who had effectively been turned out by his family at the age of 10, was taken in by a Swedish immigrant and taught him to be a jack of all trades with a team of horses to move houses and haul coal and water and drill farm wells. So when this New York aristocrat, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was elected president, they were left only with hope and the faith that somehow better days would come again, that their dreams would be delivered by a son of privilege a Harvard man and a Groton student, a summer sailor and a stamp collector. It seemed at the time like a long shot hope. I can only assume they must have known that he was a cousin of another famous Roosevelt, Teddy, who after all had a great Blaine's experience as a hunter and as a cattle rancher. But this Roosevelt, what did they know? Well, in his first inaugural address, he spoke directly to their hardy constitutions and never say they die attitude on any challenge that was before them. We have nothing to fear, but fear itself. What a pitch perfect declaration from the commander in chief at a time of great despair, not just in America, but in the world. It was not lost on them that they were championed by a man from another world entirely different than their, than their daily grind on sweat and toil. They'd lost faith and one of their own, Herbert Hoover of Iowa, the Stanford mining engineer, who brilliantly saved Europe during a famine and then lost America to colossal economic frenzies. FDR's swift invocation of the federal government to halt the slide with a variety of federal programs to create jobs, regulate reckless financial dealings, and offer the country a new deal was a beacon of hope and a reassurance to the poor that they were not alone, they had a champion in the White House. By now, FDR's place is not just in American history, but in the pantheon of leadership genius throughout the world and throughout history. But how did it come to this? And what are the enduring lessons, especially now, when there is so much angst and anxiety and division in America about leadership and the people who can see beyond their own narrow, selfish needs. First, FDR grew up with an unparalleled model. His cousin Theodore, the racket-busting, hard-charging man in the bully pulpit, who was always the man in the arena of a variety of experiences. His family's faith, the freedom of the family fortune to pursue his passion. His mentors at Groton and Harvard at a time when young men of a certain class were raised in the noblesse oblige tradi tradition. When he arrived at the White House, Franklin Roosevelt had been well-traveled in Europe. He'd been an assistant secretary of the Navy, a candidate for vice president of the United States, governor of New York, 
and he was married to Eleanor, a powerful force of political compassion for the underrepresented. They shared political values, we now know, more than matrimonial values by all accounts, and the country was a coincidental beneficiary. At the same time, he came to the Oval Office as a man in full, except for his paralyzed legs, which I'm here to tell you most of America didn't realize just how severely disabled he was. My parents were astonished, and most of the people in the Midwest were astonished, and other parts of the country, when they finally realized that he was completely paralyzed from the waist down. My friend Ben Bradley once saw him being loaded into a car in the South Street Station in Boston, and he was shocked, he said, by the inability of him to control his body. He said his head slammed back, and they had to push him in place. Think about that and think about the fact that we never saw him without a smile of reassurance on his face. The cigarette holder, the jaunty appearance, pinching his glasses, the hat on the back, going to play softball against members of the press. We do not know for sure how that daily struggle for such a vigorous man affected his internal compass, but how could it not? When he shared with the world the four freedoms that he believed ought to be the American legacy to nations everywhere, not just in our shores, he believed in making the world great, not just in some artificial way of making America great again. The four freedoms that grace this magnificent park he spoke of, he was a man who embodied those freedoms of speech and worship, freedom from want and fear, but a man who was not free in his own limbs, a vigorous man in every other way. He led us out of the Depression, as ambassador, as ambassador just reminded us, and through the greatest war in the history of mankind from a wheelchair and private, and with the help of AIDS in public. I've been to the British Embassy in Tehran, where they had that extraordinarily important meeting with Stalin and Churchill, and of course, of uh, President Roosevelt. And it's the most evocative place I've ever been during that time, with the exception of Norway. Because I could walk down the halls of a small study where Roosevelt was wheeled in to have a meeting with Stalin. Churchill was pacing outside, feeling that he might be left out. They still have the dinner places, as only the Brits would, <laughs> the dining room just outside, so you could see who was seated where. And I could only imagine what that evening must have been like. These three men representing the greatest powers in the world taking on the greatest desperate in the world and trying to arrange a future. His joy to me was contagious. His courage was unparalleled. His use of language was like that of his friend Winston Churchill. In its own way, it was a fighting force. As a man, as a public servant, as a historic figure, he is an immortal presence in our lives. He's also a moral presence in the preservation of this precious nation and in the world itself. Finally, I'd like to share a very personal story about the impact that he had on my wife Mary's family. When he was campaigning for vice president in the 1920s, he came to South Dakota. It's before he was paralyzed. Mary's grandfather was a great Prairie populist cowboy. He was six foot four and he weighed more than 300 pounds and he only wore a black stetson. <laughs> and as you might expect, they bonded, in part because at the end of the day, Franklin Roosevelt could say to Mary's grandfather, Harvey, get us some hooch. <laughs> the prohibition was on. And Graham said he always thought that if he got thrown in jail, there was a possibility that FDR would have enough connections to get him out. <laughs> But they formed this amazing personal relationship because they had such shared values. Here was Meredith's grandfather, Guy Harvey, who'd grown up in the hard plains of western South Dakota, who with his mother in the wintertime would sit on homesteads where she got 50 cents a day for sitting homesteads in the middle of South Dakota winters. And as a 12 year old, he was out there helping her. Now he was helping Winston, I mean, he was helping Franklin Roosevelt from the New York Roosevelt's. And they stayed in touch. And I 
often wondered how Grant was able to afford his children to college, how he was able to get along because he was not a man of great wealth. And then I realized that Roosevelt never forgot him. Grant was the chair of the March of Dimes in the Midwest, for which he got a small stipend. He was also one of the members of the WPA in the Midwest, for which he got another small stipend. So you can only imagine this large prairie cowboy and this aristocrat from New York and how they were bonded together. So when Franklin Roosevelt died, Grant, Guy Harvey, did what was only natural to him. He was so morose, he was in such mourning, he went to his room upstairs with two quarts of whiskey <laughs> and a box of cigars and did not come out for two days. <laughs> he said he wept and mourned. And when he did come down, his wife Edith, a diminutive child of the Prairie as well, had grown up on a hard scrabble ranch. Grandpa would always say with great solemnity, Edith understood. I think the combination of these two men from where I grew up and what Grant represented and where Franklin Roosevelt grew up and what he represented and they found an intersection, not just in their lives, but in their values and in the meaning of being an American. I look across this gathering tonight. It's a quintessential New York gathering. But in other parts of America, there are other gatherings like this on other occasions. But we have a common DNA. And that DNA is that we're Americans. And there are people who come to us in our history who constantly remind us of that. And no one did it with more eloquence, more courage, or with greater impact than Franklin Roosevelt. Thank you all very much. This is a great honor. Thank you.